learning the skills of the people ahead of you, making sure the people ahead of you were very successful and that you got promoted because you were making other people successful. And so for me, I thought, well, you know, if, if my job is to make my team successful and also my job is to make other people in the company successful, then I, I can wrap my head around that really easily, even if they're not people that are, you know, directly in my chain of command, for example. Hi, I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. Where are you based, Bill? I'm in Silicon Valley. Oh, oh you are in Los I'm Gatos. I'm Campbell. I'm the next town over. Yeah. Yeah, I, I lived in Los Gatos. Oh for in the what was it early 80s a long time ago so i was a little girl and my dad was was working mm -hmm. there so yeah yeah linda avenue i'll never forget so i went to alta vista elementary school my kids went to dave's avenue is it called Gra it's a grade school in los gatos okay. my older one was there second until he went up to middle school like my kids went through their whole the younger one went through all of his school in Los Gatos school districts. The older one, he did, we lived in Campbell when the older one was starting school and he was in multiple different schools, one of which was like two blocks from our house. So, okay. And what brought you to the Silicon Valley? Was it work? So my backstory is a little weird. When I got out of college, the first job that I had was mechanicing. I got hooked on racing cars and I started working at this. I lived in Hawaii. I came here to go to racing school and through a series of conversations, ended up interviewing at this shop in Redwood City. And I spent seven years mechanicking on Ferraris and Lamborghinis and vintage race cars. Wow. And that was interesting. And then I spent a few years in real estate because cars became boring. And then a friend of mine asked, if I would help him with sales to two people who I knew uh, for a startup mm -hmm. and he was building websites. And so they both wanted websites built. I don't know that I was any good at sales, but because they were friends, they said yes. And then I got a job doing sales, but I wanted to learn like, what was I selling? And I became a software engineer. And then, the, wow. yeah. Okay. And it, and the next company I went to, you know, that first company, you know, I think I was there for a year, something like that. And then they cratered. And then I went to another company and was there four years, built my first team, learned more programming languages, built a nice profitable business, and then went to another company, learned another language, ended up running another team. It's been a fun ride. Mm. And the ride has led you to do what you're doing right. now. Tell us what you're doing now. Bill. So 40% better is scratching an itch that I started having when I got my first leadership position, which is I wanted some mm -hmm. kind of a program, a course, a book, a something that would give me a systematic approach to effective leadership for teams. And because, you know, as a first time mid-level manager, I was really nervous because I had no idea how to help my team be successful. And so mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything. I started doing a, a lot of research. And 10 years later, the next itch was my teams were doing things people said were impossible over and over again. And I had peers and executives coming and saying, like, how did you do that? We don't know how to do that. We couldn't have done that, but your team just did it. What are you doing? And I didn't know how to explain mm -hmm. it. Move up to five years ago, my now partner interviews me because she wants to know what I'm doing, but she asks a very, very different set of questions. And at the end of the conversation, she goes, okay, now I know exactly what you're doing. And I said, great, because I don't. Tell me, please. And she said, you're using for performance a set of skills and mental models that we teach people clinically to get them out of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and PTSD. And I said, wow, now I'm super curious. Teach me because I want to know how to, I want to understand what it is that I'm doing. And so 
she did. And then she helped me to reverse engineer everything I was doing and to understand how to make it translatable to anybody else. And so 40% better really, it answers that question I had when I first started my career. And then the questions I started getting after 10 years when people kept saying, how are you doing that? Now I know how to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. And where does the 40% comes from? <laughs> so one of the companies that I worked at, the day that I started, the CTO was doing onboarding and talking to me and blah, 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 new computer, everything else. At the end of the conversation, he said, you know, one more thing, I'm sorry to say this, but I'm giving you the worst software team in the company. And they've been together for almost 10 years. We've tried everything to make them work better. Good luck. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I like a good challenge. And I went off to work with my team. And six months later, I walk into the office one day and he goes, hey, Bill, can you come in here and talk to me? And I said, of course, what, what's going on? And he said, what have you been doing to your team? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, your team is the best performing team in the company. In the last six months, they've improved their coding throughput by 40%. We've never been able to make that happen before. What are you doing? You got to teach me. And I said, I don't know how to explain it. I take really good care of my teams. And that's all I know what to say. And he said, well, when you figure it out, you have to teach me. And so that's really what 40PP is all about. I see, Nishi. When people came to you and said, your team is doing that, things that we couldn't do, what is it that they're doing, Bill? Is it technical things that they were being able to accomplish? I'm trying to understand if it's innovation or is it was more cohesion in the group or both? It's a little bit of all the above. At the most foundational level, the thing that I was doing was I was creating an environment where the people on my team had a very, very high level of psychological safety. And at the mm -hmm. time, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. I had a set of mental models that I operated by that I assumed everybody else did. And I built a skill stack to support those mental models. And, and I, I, at that point in time, I assumed everybody had both the same mental models and the same skill stack that I did. Part of what my partner helped me realize is that that's not the case. And since then, as I've been figuring out how to build this course in interviewing people, I've heard them say the exact opposite of mental models that I'm carrying, right? And, I, and then I realized, oh, now I know why you couldn't do it because I had a self-empowering belief and someone else has a self-limiting belief. Clearly, we're going to go in very, very different directions. And so the first one is you get better contribution into team meetings for how to do things, how to move forward. And so people who had previously been shy and just followed along started contributing brilliant ideas that they had never said before, right? People take ownership because now I'm not the smartest one in the room. I, I want them to be the smartest people in the room. I'm trying very hard even if I've got an idea about how to solve a problem, I'm waiting till the absolute end to even whisper it because I'm really hoping that my idea is not the best idea and that someone else is going to have a better idea or at least someone's going to have the same idea that I did. And so I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to contribute and to think and to talk and to collaborate. And when people take ownership, all of a sudden their productivity levels just jump through the roof. And it's part of the mental model that I have is that the starting point of being a team leader is being untrusted. And it's not that I, it, you know, on the, on a trust scale that goes from negative something to zero to positive, I assume that as a team lead, when I start off, I'm the negative and I have to do work to build it up to zero, right? And yeah. then as I create more trust with the team, then they're willing to be more vulnerable because they know that I've got their back, that I've been feeding them what they needed so that now they feel a little bit safer. And, and they're willing to say, I've got this idea and maybe it's a little crazy, but now I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to put it out there in front of the team. 
Bill, what I think is fascinating is that what you said before about you not knowing how to explain mm -hmm. is very common, right? So I work with clients who are looking for work and they're middle managers to senior yep. managers and executives. And when they're asked in an interview, tell me about your leadership style. Mm -hmm. They don't know. They don't, they, they don't know how to explain it because they don't have what your partner has, which is that background that allows them to to frame it in a way yeah. that is sort of part of the the management research science, right? right? So they, they don't they don't know how to explain it. But the thing that is fascinating is that your intuition on how to manage teams was really mm -hmm. high. Whereas a lot of people come from the ground up, you know, they're experts in their fields, in their professions, and then they're promoted to become leaders. And then they, well, fail miserably or they become what we, you know, call assholes. Right. <laughs> like really bad sort of bad management. They might be good people in their mm -hmm. hearts. They just don't know how right. to manage. So how did you, what do you think was different about you that allowed you to have that perception and be a good leader? That's a great question. There's a couple of things that were inputs to the program in my head, right? The first one is I have to give a ton of credit to my dad. My dad worked in supply chain management in the U.S. military. And he always said that his success was attributable 100% to the people on his teams because he was moving equipment that was thousands of pounds. His team's were moving equipment that were thousands of pounds, and there was nothing that he could do by himself, even if he wanted to. And so everything that happened that was successful was because everybody's working together. And so repeatedly, he would say, like, my job is to make sure my team is successful, and anything I can do to help them be successful is within the scope of what I should be doing. It's, it's the scope of my responsibility. And so that early on gave me some mental framing for how to think about leadership. The second thing is when I was in college, I worked in a very high-end restaurant. It was the only restaurant I ever worked on. I went in, interviewed, they liked people with no experience, and they were very clear on the responsibilities of every level in the organization, what you needed to do, because everybody started at the ground level, and what it took to move up inside the organization. And a lot of what they talked about was learning the skills of the people ahead of you, making sure the people ahead of you were very successful and that you got promoted because you were making other people successful. And so for me, I thought, well, you know, if, if I'm, if my job is to make my team successful and, and also my job is to make other people in the company successful, then I, I can wrap my head around that really easily. Even if they're not people that are you know, directly in my chain of command, for example, right? So mm -hmm. the first team that I got, at the time that I got it, I was already going to other parts of the company and seeing where other people had struggles and trying to figure out how to help them out. Like, you know, what is it that I can do that will, that will make their lives easier? And clearly the executives were happy about that. Yeah, which leads me to another question mm -hmm. for you which is something that we see a lot in, in management research. It's when a great leader provides a safe environment within a department or function which he leads. But outside of that silo, the company culture is not that great. And I was wondering if you have experienced yeah. that, where you were you know, doing the best you can for your team, they felt safe working under you, and then if they were moved to a different uh, project or if they had to do some cross-functional activity, they were kind of a bit burned by mm -hmm. it, you know, not excited to, to work outside of your environment. Yeah. How do you deal with that? So there's a few different answers to that question. The first answer is mm -hmm. a smart company that understands the ROI of having happy employees will hire somebody like us to come in and do a training for the middle managers, the first level team leads, 
because that's really where you've got the most impact. And you know, I don't mean to be demeaning of people that are, have chief whatever or vice or president in their title, but on a day-to-day -day basis, individual contributors are the ones that are moving the company forward. They're actually making the sales, writing the code, putting out marketing content. And the first level managers who are running those teams actually have the most power on a day-to-day basis to influence the productivity. And I didn't invent this idea. The CEO that actually gave me my first team role said that to me one day as I was kind of struggling mm -hmm. because I wanted to ask him for something for my team and, and I didn't know how to do it effectively. Look, mm -hmm. you've got way more power than I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was like, wait, what? But you're the C guy. And he said, no, no, you're the one that's actually making this happen. I'm layers insulated away and you're, you're right there at the ground level. Your perspective is better than mine. What do you want? Getting that mentality across the whole company is really, really important, right? My perspective on it is that it's good ROI, right? Your company will make more money, which hopefully if you're in the C-suite you care about, when your people are operating really, really well. And there's, there's a bunch of research about this already. And if you're somebody who, you know, you're in a team and you're happy about it and it's working really well because your leadership is working well, and then you go to a team that's not working so well, what can you do to influence that team to help them operate better? And, mm -hmm. and how can you start behaving like whatever you experienced in your first team? And maybe even, you know, ask that manager, leader, supervisor, whatever they're called to mentor you so that you can start having an influence in the new team. Because, you know, I've had yeah. roles in teams where I wasn't the guy in charge and, and I experienced this like, wow, these guys do not run this show very well. And so, but I, I had the skills to figure out how do I help as many people as I can to operate more effectively in this environment, even though they don't work to me mm -hmm. and that makes yeah. them happier. Bill, the fact that you are in Silicon Valley, is such a, an interesting sandbox because I see what you're saying in some organizations, you know, that, that have amazing understanding of the value of their human resources, their people, yeah. and they, they do that in an authentic way, not in, oh, let's offer you a massage mm -hmm. and, you know, a ping pong table or anything like that. So you have those sort of really authentic leaders in the Valley, but you still have the dichotomy of the Silicon Valley is that you still have quite well-known companies, which I'm not going to name, where the CEOs and the founders, they get performance out of their people by, you know, stressing them mm -hmm. out, you know, and then in that anxiety, which I know you've written about, I want to ask yeah. you about that, is yeah. part of their brand, is part of how they believe they can get the best out of people, right? So we you sort of... When you were working, did you avoid those places or, you know, did you end up in those places and then said, well, I don't belong here? You know, how, how do you figure out if this is going to work right. and you're going to be able to change the culture or not and you just need to go? Because that's, I, I ask this because I think that's probably where many of my listeners are, mm -hmm. where they're completely burnt out and worried about their situation at work, right. you know, post pandemic, you know, that their lifestyles have changed, their ambitions have yep. changed. They might have really wanted to work in those sort of high powered environments, highly stressful environments before, but now they're like, no, no, this is not for me anymore, you know. And is it worth staying and trying to be agents of change internally, or is it better to just move on and find a better culture? That's a tough one. It's going to be different for everybody, right? And, you know, I've, I've been at companies where I was 110% behind the mission and I worked ridiculous amounts of hours and I was doing it because I wanted to do it. Like the mission of the company really pulled me into, I'm going to work as much as I can, right? And, yeah. and if, you know, if you're on my team and you want to work as much as I'm wearing, great. And if you can't, that's cool too, right? Like I'm never trying to guilt people into doing what I'm doing, right? I'm just, I'm doing my thing. And, and if, and if you want to do this with me, whatever level, great, we're all good. And, you know, like 
when I started, when I had kids, all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, I got kids to take care of. I've got to figure out how to get really, really focused on my time, get my time wasted as close to zero as possible and get way more dense productivity so that I can actually go home and be with my kids. Right. And that for me, that was a forcing factor to actually help me improve what I did at work so I could get out of the office. And I don't think a lot of people have that as a mental model. Right. You know, I used to turn down meetings because I was like, I, I don't need to be there. I'm not a contributor into the conversation. And so, and there's really nothing going on there that I need to be there to hear about. And I've got other higher priorities. Um, mm. And so that gave me time. Right. And I also tried to figure out how to be as focused and efficient as possible. And I've been at companies where I thought, wow, I do not want to be here any longer. This is not the place for me. And I started looking for roles at other companies where first and foremost, for me, it's whatever they're doing is interesting to, to whatever my desire happens to be at the time. And that always is the, when the work that I'm doing is fun and exciting and it, and it pulls me, there's no burnout. It's like, you know, no matter how much time I'm investing with my kids, I'm never burnt out about it. Like for me, that's, that's all, it's all a win. It's the same thing with, with the work that I'm doing, right? It, at whatever stage it is, it's when the company, the burnout happens because the company isn't aligning itself with what I'm doing and I'm not able to align with them, right? And in my head, mm -hmm. leadership's role is to make that as much as possible, that alignment happen. I've been at big companies. Um, I'm trying to be politically correct here. Big companies aren't for me because there's too many people worried about we might get it wrong and they move really slowly. Yeah. And I much prefer smaller companies that move, move faster. Right. Uh, I get that. And I think knowing what sort of scale suits yeah. your uh, way of working is so important, yeah. isn't it? That's really something that I like to work with my clients yeah. as well. One thing that you mentioned that I I really wanted to discuss because I, like I said, you know, this is the job hunting podcast. So if people are reaching out to listen to the job hunting podcast, there's something there that they're trying to achieve, right? right? right. So, and there's a level of anxiety as well about their career status quo or, you know, the yep. next steps yep. in their career advancement and so forth. And you wrote recently, anxiety only shows up when people don't have a trusted system. And I really related to that. I remember feeling quite anxious in my work or in my situation. And that was when I didn't trust not just the system, but my own instincts in that environment, yes. right? So I, I'd like you to sort of expand on that sure. in terms of that link between anxiety and trust that I think sure. is, is sure. quite fascinating. So this is, you know, my, my partner works in mental health, right? She's a clinician, occupational therapist by trade. She's been deep in the mental health world for a number of years now and at local award-winning hospital program, they get people at the very emergency end of the mental health spectrum. And there's a whole bunch of research around anxiety, depression, PTSD, variety of other things. And this is hard for me to say out loud to people because for some people, this is really triggery, but it's for a lot of people, it's a lack of knowledge that puts them in that place. There's decades of research behind this right now, clinical research, that when you have more knowledge to understand what's going on in your body, you change your behavior and those old anxieties become a part of history, right? A simple example, you live in Australia, right? Yeah. So yeah. Australia, a lot of people go in the water a lot and have a great mm -hmm. lifeguard system. I grew up mostly on islands. I lived in Hawaii for a number of years. For me, the water is a big playground. I have a mental model about the water being a playground and it started when I was five or six still exists today. My kids, I've taught them also. I know people that are terrified of the water. They have a lot of anxiety about the water. It's the same water that I think is a playground. And for them, they don't want to go anywhere near it. The water is still the same water. It's just, I've had a system 
to operate in the water and feel safe and relaxed and comfortable and my kids and everything else. And they don't have that system and they don't have the mental model. Right. So, you know, my, my partner used to help 15 to 25 year olds go from self-harm to really happy and delighted about life. And a lot of the process was, oh, here's how you manage your brain chemistry. Here's all the knobs and leverages you have on your own biologically to manage your own brain chemistry. Here's are the things that you can do to trash your own brain chemistry. Knowing that if you recognize you're going down a path of trashing your brain chemistry, which by the way, when you do that, it's super easy to get anxious or depressed. You can pattern match and go, wait a minute, I need sleep, right? I haven't had sleep in, in three days. Maybe that's why I feel like crying all the time. And mm -hmm. so now you know what to do because you've got control of yourself. You've got a system you can leverage, right? In the yeah. job search, if you, and, and, you know, and I've done job searches before, you know, because that's the way nature goes, right? We get laid off or we decide we don't want to work anymore and we quit. Yeah. Having a system and a process, and I don't necessarily know which of the knobs and levers in the job search is going to get me an interview, but I know that one of them will, right? So I'm networking, mm -hmm. I'm talking to my friends, I'm connecting with people on LinkedIn that are working at companies that look interesting, I'm applying to jobs right? Wherever I happen mm. to run across them. And so I trust that that system will work. And every day I put in whatever the amount of effort is I've decided I need to do day after day after day. And, and I know from history that I will get results, right? It's mm. kind of like, you know, if, if I want to get stronger, I'm going to go to the gym and lift weights and I might not notice any gains for a while. And then one day I'm like, holy cow, my max just went up by 20 pounds. Great. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, so it's, it's being willing to invest yourself in that system and, and not being impatient about the results. That's a, and, yeah. I, and I think that impatience is where people are like, I've applied to 20 jobs. Someone should hire me right now. 20 may be a bit of a low bar, you know, and yeah. if you don't know what the, what the scale number is and you're not tracking it and you're not actually doing a, a statistical comparison to other people, then, then you don't know. Yeah. I'd love to add a story to that water analogy you, you just mentioned, going back to the anxiety and the trust system. You're right about, you know, Australians and the water. I'm actually originally from Brazil, so I'm very, you know, I feel mm -hmm. safe in, in yeah, the water. Yeah. Well, we, we have quite a lot of sharks here, and that really... <laughs> scared me at the beginning and made me quite anxious. I have had shark encounters in four or five different occasions here. And what I think has happened over time is that my level of anxiety has decreased to the point where now I don't need to tell everybody I've seen a shark. I don't feel like, you know, it's not a right, big deal right. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not scared. I mean, if, if it was a big white one, of course, uh, it, it would be different. But just a few weeks ago, I was um, swimming at my favorite beach. There was a bottom feeder mm -hmm. shark. So it's a, you know, it's one of those low, they, they just stay near yeah. the, the sand and, and they have, they're not dangerous at all. And I just swam by it. I'm like, oh, there you are. <laughs> Whereas if this was... 20 years ago, when I first moved here, I would have made an amazing song and dance about it. Now, why is this important in the context of our listeners? If you have never gone to a job interview or a high stakes job interview, you will be scared shitless of it. But if you practice for it or the more you do it, either by mimicking the same, the same environment which is something that I try to do with my clients when they, we're doing preparation or by just going to interviews, mm -hmm. you know, and just sitting there and knowing that if you don't get a job, it's a great learning experience anyway. You're getting used to exactly. the adrenaline, to the cortisol and all. That's your big white shark right there, right? Yeah. So, so that anxiety that comes, you might be able to get used to it and manage it and, and decrease it. And you might gain more trust in the whole process mm -hmm. of working with a team, working with a new manager, going for job interviews, whatever it is that you have to do in your corporate yeah. career. Yeah. yeah. 
So that that's my that's story. Perfect. <laughs> what you're talking about there is the practice effect, right? Yeah. It's you're just practicing. It's like juggling, right? The first mm -hmm. time you get three hacky sacks and you try to juggle, there's three on the floor, and and mm -hmm. as you learn the technique and you practice one day you're juggling and you're like, holy cow, I can do this, right? One of my mental hacks is when I go to interviews, I always think of it as a practice run. I never think of it as actually being a serious, high stress interview. Is I just think, mm -hmm. oh, this is another practice run. I'm just practicing for the real thing, which will come someday. And it decreases my stress level, for one, right off the bat. And it allows me to be a little more playful in how I'm thinking about approaching it because I'm not taking it so seriously, right? It decreases my perceived yeah. risk. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's an interesting take. I guess it makes you feel more comfortable in the environment. Yeah. With that. yeah. yeah. And it's... I like that. I, I think as long as you convey the right level of energy... Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want people to listen to this and think, oh, I, I will be nonchalant about it and I'll just sort of play cool. Right, right. That, that's not yeah. really, you know, the, the way to engage with the audience. Yeah, it's right? a, for me, it's a way to hack my own head, to have myself mm -hmm. be relaxed in the context. And, you know, it's so far it's, it's worked pretty well. With the work that you mm -hmm. do, I'm interested to know if there has been a change post-pandemic with the hybrid work environment, right? So people, I guess in the Silicon Valley, as far as I understand it, people have been able to do some of that, right? Sort of have flexibility, work from home, kind of. Some big companies haven't didn't allow that before. Now they do like Facebook and you had to go. Uh, now they're sort of looking into it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But... What does that mean for you consulting with companies trying to make leaders more effective in a async kind of environment, you know, in this sort of virtual online kind of environment? Does it change the way that you lead people because they're working remotely? Um, so I started working with remote teams when it was still very new. I've been doing this since 2000. Yeah. I got in very, very early and... You know, I, I had teams all over the planet. And so I got mm -hmm. very used early on to that operation. And yeah. like when I was at Google, there's people all over the world, right? And I've got to figure out how to, how to operate with them, how to get meeting times to work. You know, they're 12 time zones away. I'm, okay, great. How do, you know, how do we find a time that meets, that works? The things that I noticed is that, that it's the same practices and processes. So one of the things that I do is I do weekly one-on-ones with everybody on my team where I want to hear from them about what's going on. Like, it's not about me being able to tell them anything. I just want to be a pair of ears and I don't really care if they're here in front of me or they're in Europe somewhere, right? Or they're in Australia for that matter. As long as we can have a time, we can sit for 15 minutes and I can say, Renata, what's going on in your world? right? What do you want? What do you need from me to help you advance your career? Because at the end of the day, I mm -hmm. see my job as being about preparing you for wherever it is you want to go to next, right? And giving you those, you know, those advancement opportunities to build yourself, your skills, your leadership ability, whatever it is. And so as long as I'm doing that consistently, back to earlier, I'm building trust. Right? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm asking you, how can I help you? And I've, I've done this with teams that are literally all over the place. And yeah. then I, I've been doing Agile for a very long time, Agile software development. And so we have daily stand-ups. And depending on where everybody is, the time for that can change. You know, if you know, I've got people on the team, they're getting their kids to school. We're not doing the meeting until after they get home right? With a buffer for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And so, and the, the team appreciates all that, right? And, and it works really easily. I think that not enough team leads are focusing on building their people 
because they don't have that as a mental model. And so I always think about how do I help you get ahead in your career? And you mm -hmm. could say, I'm totally happy where I'm at right now. I don't want to move ahead. This is perfect. Right. And I'm okay, cool. If you change your mind, let me know. Right. If mm -hmm. you know, you're like, oh, my kids are struggling with school. Somehow I need to change my schedule. I'm like, okay, fine. How do we make it work? Right. It's very rare that I've had anybody take advantage of that. And it's because the general consensus in the team is we're being well taken care of. We need to reciprocate. Right. And everybody has ownership of the stuff they're building. And so they, they're, they're very aligned and they're very productive. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And it made me think of the first time I was given a leadership position in Australia because I, I moved here in my late 20s, studied, got a job, got another job. And then I was promoted up from being part of a team to then being managing mm -hmm. that team. Nothing is more awkward than that. Pio, I don't know if you've been in that situation. <laughs> You're there, you're part of the team, you know, they're sharing all the gossip and complaining about the manager. All of a sudden, you're right, the manager. Right. And it's so awkward. And, and I came up with this question that I, I had with my new team, my former colleagues, my new team, with their one-on-ones. And I don't know if anyone knows where I got this idea from, please let me know. But... I'll take it as my own for now because it's so original and I haven't, I, I don't know where I got it from, but I remember telling them, look, see, I already knew all their secrets, <laughs> right? So now I am your manager and I can help you move in, move up or move out. And I want to help you. And, and I knew, and I said that because I knew some of them were so unhappy mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, wanted to move were very ambitious and others were just sort of floating around. So I gave them three options and some moved out. I was their reference yep. and so forth. Some moved up, some moved in. And, and I like that. I, I think that you're right. I think it's not part of the leader's mental models, but sometimes it's not part of their KPIs either. Like even when they're onboarded into a role, they're not even told what to do. <laughs> In terms yeah. of people and capability, professional development for their team. It's all, it's an afterthought. It's not really right. something that yes. is discussed. It wasn't discussed in my onboarding ever, like in all of my roles, even when I was managing mm -hmm. quite large teams. So that's my experience. What do you think could be some of the signs for people starting new jobs? You know, people are listening to this podcast, they get a new job. What would be the subtle signs of a healthy versus an unhealthy leader and sort of workplace dynamics that they should be wary of when they start a new job? So I think about it in the interview process before, yeah. I, before yeah. I get in the door, right? And I typically, so I approach interviews a little bit differently. I ask mm. a lot of questions and and I'm asking the questions because I really want to understand what it is I'm getting into and what the success metrics are that they're looking for. And sometimes they, they have answers and sometimes they don't, which is okay. I just, I want to figure out what's the game that I'm, that I'm going to be playing. Um, that helps me understand mm -hmm. how they are about career advancement. Because I get to ask questions like, oh, you know, how long have you been here? What has your role been? How's your, how have your responsibilities changed over time? What's, you know, what's this, what's the, the system like for supporting advancement, for supporting knowledge? You know, if, if I want to get trained in something new because I see how it'll really help the team, what's the process? And, and that helps me understand their, their approaches. And mm -hmm. oftentimes what I hear is executives who say, oh my God, we love to train people. Nobody ever asks. And so... That for me is an interesting data point that I want to learn more about once I get in. And so if they say that, then I know that, okay, great. If there's something I want, I can go and ask for it because they've already said that that's okay, but I need to frame it so it's a win for them. And, and yeah. I, I need to be able to talk about why, if I want this training or if I want a new computer, or, you know, I want to do this stuff for my team why there's a net positive ROI for the company. 
because it seems to me that the farther you go up in the in the org chart, the more money is a thing that your KPIs are tied to. And so if I can tie, oh, if I go do this course and it's going to be $600 for me to go take this course, but it's going to allow our team to save three hours a week, that's a net positive in a very short amount of time, right? And so I, tr- I think about positioning things in that way. Usually it works. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. That it's such a great opportunity. Sometimes people underestimate how much you can learn yeah. from paying really good attention to the recruitment process, asking the right questions. You know, candidates sometimes are so excited about it all that they kind of overlook mm-hmm. it. But it you can tell a lot. Bill, I have coaching clients on all four time zones in the United oh, wow. States. Considering yeah. I mean Considering I'm in Australia, that is hard <laughs> to say the least. But what I wanted to know from you, because you're there and because you're talking to leaders and talking to companies and observing the job mm-hmm. market, but my experience, just in comparison with the job market in Australia or in other parts of the world where I have clients as well, in the US, there are many, many more applicants per jobs Mm -hmm. than in Australia, right? So a popular high demand job in Australia would have like 50 applications, you know, listed on LinkedIn jobs. If I have a client in New York, that would be 300. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And, and, And that is very complicated. How do managers see through those applications and make decisions? This is going to make some people really annoyed. (laughs) <laughs> oh no <laughs> sorry one more reason yeah. for us to to go so, into that topic <laughs> you know on linkedin you see there's this many applications but if you look in the applicant tracking system there's actually a thousand mm-hmm. and so yeah. the applicant has about six seconds to stop the first level screener from saying no and so you've got to be able to have some kind of content that will get somebody's attention, right? If you're in the big pool. Yeah. If you're a referral from somebody inside the company, it automatically raises your stature, which is why I'm kind of networking mm-hmm. and talking to people and and getting that warm introduction. Yeah. And and moving and being able to to have a conversation with somebody in a way that's valuable to them. That, that's mm-hmm. you know, the, um Gary Vaynerchuk always talks about you know, give 60%, get 40% and know that 40% is plenty. And so mm-hmm. whenever I'm talking to somebody and I'm thinking about the networking, I'm thinking, well, what can I do for them? Right. What is it that I know that they don't know? Or is there mm-hmm. someone I can introduce them to right off the bat? Right. Maybe they've got a technical problem that I know somebody who can help them with. I'm trying to be valuable before I'm even in the interview process. And that means I, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to network and how to get to know people. And I reach out to people on LinkedIn and I ask friends for introductions. And that moves me into a much smaller list, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to go from the thousand person in the ATS and the applicant tracking system down to the 50 to get into the Australian numbers <laughs> referral, yeah. you know, the, the scale is big. And, you know, frankly, if it's someplace like, like Google, where you got another yeah. zero added onto the back end of that, you've got to know somebody inside the company in a role who can get you into the interview, who knows you well enough to hand walk your resume to somebody again, the networking, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, or yeah. here's the other, the other part of this. If your resume shows that you've done a bunch of interesting and valuable things that matter to that, that make sense to the company, then Mm -hmm. that will, that will elevate you. That's how I got into Google was my resume was diverse and Mm -hmm. that caught the hiring manager's attention. And yeah, that, that, that was the, the thing that got me in the door was he saw these different things I'd done. And it was unusual because of the of the of yeah. the breadth, right? Yeah, it 
I love that because some people, the most people, tend to look at their careers and only see the negatives. And somebody may have a career that is very diverse and multifaceted and think, oh, I haven't niched down enough, you know. Right. And th th there are certainly situations where that will be um, a challenge, but there are other situations where there will be opportunities. Exactly. So you just yeah. need to seek them out. I get it. Yeah. So w when I when I coach clients, we do talk a lot about referrals. I'm going to find another episode where I discuss this briefly because mm -hmm. so much of my quantities is, you know, behind the firewall of, you know, working with group coaching clients or, or private clients. But I have a, a podcast where I do discuss step by step how recruitment works mm -hmm. and we discuss how important referrals yeah. are. Yeah, it's good. And I'll I'll mention the link below if anybody wants to to know a little bit more about yeah. that. And another funny story is that I used to travel a lot for work and I traveling by yourself, you sit at cafes and you just listen to other people talking. And the most fascinating conversations I overheard were always in San Francisco, like, mm. <laughs> or Palo Alto, you know, and I remember like being in London or being in other towns around the world, but the, the conversations, the networking yeah. that happens, you know, in coffee shops and, you know, it's so important. You can see people discussing their careers, discussing their issues at work, sort of thinking about solutions for coding problems or innovation that they're trying to achieve or leadership problems and we we need to go back to that if if some of us listening have stopped it because lockdowns and pandemics mm -hmm. and whatnots then we need to find a way back to that because just speaking it out loud is already fascinating right but you know getting to hear what other people can contribute to your your brainstorm that, that yeah, that's even more interesting there's if, if anybody's here in the Bay Area, there's a networking group called 106 mm -hmm. Miles. It's 106 miles. Oh, okay. Um, they meet once or twice a month. They've been around for more than 10 years, and mm -hmm. it, it's I think they're on Meetup is is where you find them. Meetup.com. I was gonna say Meetup. So anybody anywhere in the world, yeah. just go to Meetup, right? But I'll I'll find a link yeah. in the we meet in Palo Alto and post. San Francisco. Has mm -hmm. historically been the two places where they do meetings once or twice a month, and it, it's an amazingly eclectic group of people. And the other one is mm -hmm. a group called Scrappy Startup, that oh, that also it. is here, and they do they do even more networking events. They they're doing I want to say like four a month, and again. Super eclectic, very broad membership in there. Yeah. Awesome. Bill, it has been really lovely to talk to you. Great. Understand what 40%, I was like, oh, I really need to remember to ask him what 40% is all about. And I like the focus on leadership that comes from the ground up. You know, like he's something you've noticed and that intuition of yours that sort of you were able to develop. You were very lucky that you found a partner to help you yeah. with that <laughs> partner in life and in sort of developing your your thought leadership. So well thank done. You. Thank you. And let's yeah, keep in touch. Yeah. And, and, you know, if, if you have more content that you think would be beneficial for the oh, listeners definitely. of this type of yeah. podcast. Yeah. So definitely come okay. back to us. Yeah. Do you have any further pearls of wisdom for, for people looking for work as they are listening to this? The thing that I notice is that people tend to, to do what's called negative mental filters. And we, okay. we pattern match or we confirmation bias on the negative news, not the positive. Mm -hmm. It's super common human behavior. And so knowing that this happens, if we can consciously go, wait a minute, let's go look for the good news, right? Oh, five of my friends just got jobs. I got three new yeah. people that I can network with yesterday and really focus on the little wins rather than, than being stuck on focusing on the negative. Because there's, there's always a bunch of little wins available if we put the work in to make them happen. And so for me, it's yeah. always, what's the work I can do that will get me those little wins and those little wins back up over time, right? It's the, it's the you know, if you're 1% better every day, that's a lot. 
when you look at it over a period of time. And so I just focus on the positives a lot and I'm human. I'm like, okay, stuff's not gonna work out. But when I focus on the positives, I don't get anxious and depressed. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it's a good message to end this episode. The listeners will appreciate that. Bill, thank, thank you, you so much once again. Amazing. It's been awesome talking to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>